topic today and a, a great speaker to fill us in on this. So I think that whether we love this idea or not, we are all been pulled into the world of gamification and gaming. And many of us associate it with Fruit Ninja or Angry Birds or many of the things that we or our children or other people we know use a lot, but it is a huge industry as I think we all know. And what's been very interesting is that the, 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 the field of gamification has shown up in many other areas. And I recently, not too long ago, became aware of the phrase serious gaming and or serious gamification. You guys can help me make sure I'm getting this right. And in fact, during the summit, I was talking to Kim Seals, Rachel Van Kim, who is a member of Golden Sea. She works at Mercer. She lives in Atlanta. And she is in the field of HR consulting at Mercer. And she started explaining how serious gaming is being used in the area of talent acquisition. So that became fascinating to, to many of us because of the fact that it's a, an application of gaming that is very interesting. Uh, and it also will help us understand, hopefully, how gamification is being used in, in, in various ways. So she has brought with us her partner, who, um, Barb, Barb Barber, who is a, a colleague of Kim's at Mercer. Barb is a senior partner of, um, HR in, in HR Consulting. She's the global innovation leader for Mercer's talent business. She oversees an innovation team um, that develops products for additional, for, for optimal talent acquisition, and in particular is focusing on the area of how technology and talent intersect, ta talent acquisition and talent management intersects. So Barb came to us today from Baltimore to be with us to talk about this whole field. I know she's willing for you to jump in and ask questions along the way, but she does have a presentation she'll go through. So we'll go for 45 minutes or so. So thank you, Barb, come on up. Okay. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> well, Kim, you didn't tell me I was going to get a applause. That's <laughs> <laughs> a great way to start. Uh, thanks so much for having me. And I think the concept of gamification, serious gaming, as applied to talent and talent acquisition is fascinating. So I have some slides that a crazy presentation I'll walk through. Really just, it's actually just kind of a bunch of trends and data points to set the stage. And then hopefully we'll have a kind of an interactive conversation about what's going on. I'll take, I'd love to hear your feedback, your questions. Um, any of this going on in, in firms that you're associated with or aware of, so I'd love to get feedback from you guys as well. So what, what's causing some of these new, um, new trends? It's really what's actually going on in the workplace. And I'm sure you all have seen some of the really interesting statistics around workforce challenges. Uh, and what's really interesting is, at least for us at Mercer, and I know Kim, you would share this, when we go out and talk to our corporate clients, we always hear that they can't find the skill talent they need. I mean, it's, it's universal. Uh, they get thousands of applicants for every position, but they're not the right people. And then, at the same time, there's this huge, huge growing number of people who are unemployed and looking for jobs. So clearly there's something wrong with the system and there's lots of reasons for that. Uh, I mean, so, so again, just more statistics, but it's, um, you know, in particular with the global economy, there will be, continue to be a shortage of um, skilled workers, college educated workers, and this is both in developed economies and developing economies. Very, very interesting statistic as we all look in terms of being global. Uh, the, the, what people are saying is that the next generation of talent globally will come from China and India. And um, I've seen stats as high as 80% of the world's engineers will come from China and India, which is really interesting. But the problem is, it doesn't matter whether you're a firm based in China or India or here in North America or in Europe, companies are not going to have a clear way to figure out what these people are about and what their credentials mean and whether they're a viable candidate. So I think that's why a lot of the new um, trends and techniques are happening. Another, I think, fascinating um, statistic, which I think will also affect the supply uh, of people in the workforce is what we call MOOCs, the Massive Online Open Courses, that if 
these are um, through Coursera and Udacity and edX uh, to you. There's, these are basically completely free online education from the top universities in the world, Harvard, Stanford, MIT, and you, you name it, great schools in, in France, London School of Economics, they come in, they offer courses for free. Millions of people internationally are taking these courses. But again, the question for employers is, how do I know? How, how do I know what that means? If you've taken that course, did you do complete the course? Uh, what did it mean that you completed the course? So, I think, again, there's lots of sources of talent, but I think it's going to be difficult for companies to figure out what they're about. Talent acquisition, clearly a huge, huge industry. And, um, and that's because it's such a critical business need. Uh, but that's also why I think there's so much innovation going on in this space, because uh, it's such a big, big industry. So let's talk about some of the trends. Recruiting going social. This one should be, I don't think, surprising to anyone. Every, everyone comfortable with the you know, LinkedIn, impact of LinkedIn on recruiting. Uh, I think you know, most, most businesses are using it now. For some companies, this has actually really changed how they recruit. And what I think is interesting is it's put a lot of power back in the hands of internal recruiters where before, in order to find those people, you may have had to use a recruitment process outsourcer an RPO, you may have had to use um, a staffing agency to help them find and source these people. Now it's sort of in your head. I think what's really interesting is there are some firms who are saying that uh, LinkedIn's already, it's already dead. I mean, there's too many people are using it, people who get the in-mails are oversaturated, I'm not taking any more in-mails, so now, LinkedIn's already dead, now it's going to be Facebook, it's going to be Twitter, it's going to be Google+. Um, so there are firms now who are gearing up to figure out how to help companies source through those channels. Um, anyone sort of hearing anything interesting about LinkedIn either way, or anybody using Facebook actively for recruiting? Um, I think it's really kind of an interesting idea. Yep? So my son graduated from uh, college last year. One of the things that the, the career placement at the, at the school intends to them about was their online profile in LinkedIn, what they're saying in Facebook, what's public. I mean, so there's a big push at the universities yeah. for schools for you know, graduates to really have these programs. So I don't remember him talking about Twitter. So. Twitter's the new LinkedIn. Yeah, I, mean, <laughs> I don't know. Why don't you start that yeah, I'm interested in your comment about LinkedIn because I, I have a sophomore student that joins this child's picture, but I've kind of wondered if he's the point where he needs to start to transition, not necessarily from Facebook to LinkedIn, but create a LinkedIn profile. Yeah. Because it seems so much, I mean, to me, it's such a much more professional networking environment than Facebook, which is yes. completely social. It seems like you need to add LinkedIn as opposed to the you know, yeah, I, I, but, but it sounds like you're saying something different. Now. Well, no, I mean, I think, to your point, I think, and I'm getting, like, LinkedIn requests from all my kids' friends. I mean, I definitely think college grads, I've been telling my kids, they, they need a LinkedIn profile. It's critical. Um, but I think what's happening with Facebook is Facebook's being very proactive with saying, you know, complete your experience, your career history. And, you know, what, what's interesting to me is my kids grew up on everyone telling them, be careful what you put on Facebook because employers will check it. And, so in my, in my kid's mind, they have kind of this bright line. Facebook is social, not company, not employment, and then you know, LinkedIn and other things that's gonna be used for employment search. So I think it'll be interesting if Facebook really is successful with you know, their career their career engagement piece. So I teach at university, and I get, even from undergrads, I get a lot of requests uh, to join, to find them on LinkedIn. And also I find that uh, from the students, there's a certain amount of distrust of Facebook that they're going to get bombarded. They don't mind in their social life having Facebook use their data in a certain way, but there's enough uncertainty when you their professional life already that a lot of them are a little wary of what they put on Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought that uh, what I'm hearing is that certainly on the, the, the uh, Twitter traffic, the millennials are really moving Instagram, and so that's part of the problem with 
Twitter is that they're just losing that group. And yeah, it's it's they just, group. I think Twitter just announced that yeah. now it can post pictures. So, yeah. I, you know, they, they all seem to figure it out. Yeah. You know, if, if somebody's going somewhere else, they'll find ways to kind of bring it back. Yeah. Uh, I'm an executive recruiter, professional um, at very, very senior level, and LinkedIn is still the dominant tool yeah. that our researchers use. Um, it, Literally 100% of the initial research is this yeah. yeah, that doesn't that doesn't surprise me. Yeah. Um, myself and my team have a really great track record with LinkedIn. It's very successful. I think two things in what I thought my team would do. If you send an email out to 200 people and it reads the same, the person on the other end of the email knows it's a, you know it's a standard formula. It's probably going to 200 people. You spend a couple minutes and personalize those emails, you get a much better email response back. Yeah. And I've taught my team to actually do passive recruiting as well. Have a nice, you know, call that professional on the other line, you know, call them at work and have a nice conversation if they can't speak, get their information, set up a call. So, you know, using LinkedIn to reach out to a candidate, it, you know, we call the 1 800 number or the phone number uh, at the company, you know, it, it's passive right. recruiting. Right. The LinkedIn uh, is, 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 the LinkedIn recruiter is well worth its, its, its yeah. money. Fantastic. Yeah. Recruiting going mobile, a uh, huge trend that, I mean, I think the stats are pretty impressive that at the moment, you know, more than half of people are applying for their jobs on a mobile device. And I think what's really interesting is if you look at most companies' career sites, including, you know, we're talking about the Fortune 100, their sites are not mobile optimized. You may be able to do something on a mobile device, but you can't, you know, upload your LinkedIn profile or your Facebook profile, and you can't mobile apply, and they're not really optimized to be text messaging you when a new job opens. So I think it's really interesting. This is a, you know, a huge trend that I think companies actually haven't quite gotten ready for. Um, video interviewing, I think, also a huge, huge trend. There's a bunch of new firms. Um, High Review's probably the the major player, but there's a lots of other firms. WePow is a new one that's just come on the market. Uh, video interviewing really changes the game in terms of being able to do outreach to so many more candidates and do it in an effective, efficient manner. And they really have it set up very well so that you know it, they automatically integrate with talent systems and things. So I think really, really important trend. Yeah. Are there any um, legal developments there? Just some of that kind of screening um, re resulting in any kind of discrimination or less diverse people being brought in? Um. Right, I think what's interesting is most of these new techniques raise legal questions. And a lot of it has to do with where in the process you're using it. So in, in, you know, in a sense that um, if you're doing face-to-face -face interviews, replacing that with a video interview shouldn't be seen as more discriminatory. If you're using video interviewing as a screening device before people even would have the chance to get in the door, maybe then it's a little bit of a different story. You know, it really depends sort of where in the process you do it. And most of these firms are really all about the compliance issues, and they'll tell you how they, you know, really engineer their product to be, you know, compliant. So, but I think it's all of these things are going to raise those issues. But do you think it's creating more inclusiveness, or do you think it? My view is that all of these are creating more inclusiveness. Um, but I'm not sure that the EEOC would share that view. But every, I'm going to say almost every conversation I've had with an organization feels like all of these new tools are great. They're wary because of the compliance issues, but all are feeling like something's going to have to change because these all are really about creating, creating more opportunities, not actually being discriminatory. I talked about the mass of all night open courses. I, I think that's just such a fascinating trend. Um, actually, I, I met with Coursera earlier this week in San Francisco. They're really the biggest of the MOOCs, the mass of all night open courses. So interestingly, uh, they started off. Well, actually, their their mission and their you know their commitment is that is to provide educational opportunities to everyone, and that's for free. And they will continue to live by that mission that all of their online courses are free. But, interestingly, they've just created, for example, a signature track. Mm -hmm. And now, if you're willing to pay $40, $50 uh, for each course, you can get a Coursera certification. 
And then if you do a series of courses in the track, you can actually end up with a certification for that course group and get to be part of a capstone project that are offered by companies. So you can see even Coursera, whose mission was you know, education for free, I mean, they're all trying to figure out how to make this commercial. I think that'll be helpful for companies because at least then you know someone's taken it, they've completed it, they're on the, sort of they're on the path for that particular um, track and you're gonna have a little more, more of a sense of what they're about. Anyone actually ever taken one of these? Yeah, was it a good experience? Great, I've taken six. Yeah, so I think they're fascinating. I looked at their course um, group before I went out there. Fascinating compliment. I mean, it's interesting. They said basically, for now, they take whatever courses anybody wants to offer. It's not at all demand driven. It's all supply driven. Whatever the university wants to put on there, they take. Uh, but they're also now trying to figure out how they make it more demand driven. You know, these are hot these are hot areas for jobs and things, so let's get courses around that. If um, anybody's interested, there's an amazing TED talk on Coursera. I know <laughs> TED videos. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. I, can, I just think they're fascinating. Um, communities and referral programs. You know, I, I our executive recruiter friend might want to comment here. But you know, I think Referrals continue to be a fantastic way to find candidates. Um, and that's really because you know something about the person other than just what's in their CV, their resume, their you know, the interview. You've got somebody who's kind of vouching for them. Um, so I think the stat that 50%, so the majority of hires will be made via referrals is interesting. Um, what's really interesting now is there are companies who are trying to automate that referral process. And basically what they do is they go out to their employees and say, you know, hey, we have an employee referral program, we give bonuses of $3,000 if you refer someone, would you like to be part of our automated referral program? And then what happens is you say yes, and then you're allowing them to actually look through, let's say, your LinkedIn connections or your Facebook contacts. And, but still before, so they would post a job, they'd go say, wow, you know, Bart Martyr looks like you know, your friend Kim Seals would be a perfect candidate for this job, would you contact him and see if she's interested? So it's still in your hands. They won't contact people directly, but you can see how that automation of it happening versus me stopping to think, oh, Mercer needs somebody to, you know, somebody needs somebody, Kim would be great, let me let me call her. So I think it's, it's a really interesting trend. There's a bunch of companies doing this now, and I think the only issue is, that LinkedIn is now getting pretty serious about uh, bringing lawsuits against companies who sort of randomly just crawl through their information. And I think these referral, technology-based referral companies, that's exactly what they're doing. So I don't know if it will be sustainable um, if LinkedIn is successful. But I think really interesting trend and really helpful in a referral program. What I was just interested in is the idea of 50% of hires coming from is, has that really changed dramatically? Because I just remembered in my career there was always something. <coughs> yeah, I don't think that. I mean, I think the I understand about um, automating it is being. Interesting. Yeah, I don't think that's a like brand new, fascinating. Wow, that's huge. You know, much bigger than it was before. I, I agree. Yeah. Can you explain uh, what you mean by the LinkedIn is bringing lawsuits against people who are crawling through the data? Yeah, so I'll give you an example, I'll give you an example of a firm that we were actually looking to potentially do some business with. Um, they're, they're basically, they're, it's called distributive crawling. They basically, they audit, they automatically, through artificial intelligence, they're basically crawling through LinkedIn and all your connections. So they get somewhere and then they go through your connections and then that leads them. So they're basically just kind of crawling through and their sort of universe gets bigger and bigger. Uh, LinkedIn just basically brought a lawsuit against them because they're not using the API in the right way and apparently they have created like artificial profiles to be able to get some of those connections. So I think, I mean, for what we've heard is their states are already being careful about use of public information for HR purposes and I think LinkedIn's getting pretty tight about the fact they've got a business to run and you know they own this data and all these companies popped up that just sort of all through their data, and you have to think at some point they will just say, "No, you have to pay me for that." So I, that's really what's happening. Yeah. Spoken to a couple.
couple of our companies recently about hiring, and it's been completely through Facebook and LinkedIn. And I got the impression they weren't actually paying LinkedIn anything, but they were using their networks to simply spread the message. Same on Facebook. So if you have a small startup with 10 employees, and they all broadcast their friends on Facebook, but they're finding that that's the fastest way to get qualified referrals. And you know, not using you know, an agency at right. all. What are the risks, do you think, to doing that, or are there risks? I mean, I think as, as long as it's your contacts, if, if it's your referrals, you know, LinkedIn doesn't own that. You own your network. I think that's part of the sort of the deal when you sign with them. I think that's, I mean, I'm not aware, but I think that would be fine. It's, it's companies who are trying to use information that LinkedIn owns or that the person owns and not paying LinkedIn for that. So interesting, um, you know, in, in terms of what we're hearing from recruiters, there, there definitely is, because of everything that's happening, there is a need for change. Um, recruiters aren't particularly thrilled with what's going on. And uh, with the economy somewhat recovering, and especially with um, some areas that are sort of heating up, software engineers, and um, there's a number of you know, professions that are heating up, the, the, the idea is that there's going to be a <coughs> lot of um, hiring in firefighting mode, uh, which will which will sort of change the way people do things and have companies start to build talent pipelines that they can tap into as those those opportunities arise. So I think because the economy's been down, sort of you can you know traditionally you can kind of find people when you need them, but it sounds like that's about to change. And then just so being able to get hired some more quickly. Um, this, you know, this war for talent is not everywhere. It's certainly not consistent. But, you know, software engineers, for example, um, innovators in particular, there are certain certain types of people or, or careers that are just going to be incredibly competitive. So, really trying to find people other ways to to get get people, uh, and, which really comes back to at the end of the day, the company's employer value proposition. And what that is and how that's communicated is going to be the differentiator. Uh, and then I think in the, in the graduate thing, I think we've talked about the whole online university, remote, local. Um, I think companies thinking that they can just sort of pick up and go to all these physical career fairs, it's just with our virtual world, that's not going to be sustainable. So for example, um, there's a firm, this firm, Grazing Careers, that does virtual career fairs, uh, where you do you know, video video or just live chats with people. So I think there's just going to be much more creative ways of, of that happening. So now we'll talk a little bit more about the gamification and, and approach there. And, and what's really happening is this idea of candidate assessment. So I want to be able to find out more about people before I hire them versus after I hire them, which is typically where assessments have been more common in leadership development and things like that. And actually, I think the, the research now is coming out, I think this is so interesting, that algorithms beat instinct. And I don't, I don't think what they're trying to say is there's no place for human involvement here. So one of the taglines that you'll see is, you know, play a game, get a job. I don't ever think it's going to be quite that simple. <laughs> but I think what, what they're saying is, you know, people tend to hire people like themselves. Um, you don't really know that much from a CV, you know, how long is an interview? 30 minutes, an hour, how much can you possibly find out? So adding some quant, quantitative, to, you know, measures to that could definitely add value in the hiring process. Uh, so I think what we're going to see here is coming, you know, coming now, companies are going to look for ways to find out more about the candidates in advance. Uh, so, for example, when you think about um, software engineers, I know, um, Bill, you were saying that you're going to need to be hiring a bunch of them. Uh, you know, you can find out a ton about these people. I think, Kim, you, you first told me about social exhaust. Yes. These software engineers leave tons of social exhaust. They're on open source coding boards. They're all over blogs. They're contributing. So if you know how to do it, you can actually go out and find out tons about coders before you hire them. You can give coding challenges. Companies will even put up a coding challenge and see who does the best. So there's just lots of ways, um, fun ways. I think, again, we're talking about kind of fun game ways to, 
find out about these people. And then there are firms, obviously, Taliban and some other Taliban is just acquired, but there's a whole bunch of firms, guild, that are actually doing that for you if you want to hire them. They'll do the social exhaust searching and find you some, some people. That was what I was really meaning by the previous question, is if you're relying on networks and you're a small company, you can't afford to hire a recruiter, you know, you're, you're, yeah, you're getting referrals, but how do you really find out if that candidate's really the right fit? Right. You know, what do you do to take these Facebook referrals or right. LinkedIn referrals and actually vet them in a more professional way? Well, and I'll, I'll show you some new techniques. I mean, I think so, the software engineers are kind of easy because you can give them coding problems or, you know, they're out there. But I think some other professions are a little, a little more